Good morning, everyone. Hi. Uh, welcome to day two of Drive. Uh, you're in the Evergreen Ballroom A, and it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the day, Mr. Carl Otto. Uh, Carl is from the University of Oregon Foundation, where he is the VP of Information Services. And normally it would be my job as a UW alum and staff person to <laughs> give some good-natured ribbing to Carl, but we have not won a football game against them in quite some time. So right. I do not have a leg to stand on here. Uh, yeah. So with that, thank you. I'll well, it off to uh, you. considering the number of times I've had a tenure at UW, <laughs> you might owe me a favor or two. So, <laughs> all right. So thanks for being here. Um, and uh, I forgot to ask if you wanted me to stand up while you introduced me, or if I should come like running up doing a victory lap. But <laughs> I guess it was I guess it was okay to be up front at the start. Um, yeah, so as he said, I'm at University of Oregon Foundation right now, and just to give you a little framework on that, um, so Oregon has a little quirk of state law in that public entities cannot accept private donations. And so uh, the foundation that I work for, uh, we exist only to support the University of Oregon, so completely affiliated with that institution. Um, but we accept all of the donations on behalf of the university. Uh, we invest all of the funds, so we have an investment arm. Um, obviously, we would need to have an accounting and finance arm then that also disperses the funds, keeps track of the money, uh, makes sure that uh, you know, our auditors are happy and that we're in compliance that way. Um, and then we have an information services office. That's the other third of the foundation. Um, and we run the alumni donor database on behalf of the university um, and, and most specifically the office of advancement, uh, which handles fundraising, external communications, alumni relations, all of those things. So we're a technology provider uh, externally to the university and then also internally to the rest of uh, the foundation uh, because we are a completely separate organization, 501c3 and like any 50 person business, we need to have all of those systems that you need to be up and running. We, um, unlike a lot of other shops that I've been a part of, we don't really have a university infrastructure around us that will host our servers. We don't have a, a university HR system that we tap into. We have to do like little mini versions of all of those. So uh, it's been a great job because a lot of that stuff has been an education for me. Um, formerly, I was at University of Washington, uh, actually a couple of different stints there. Um, uh, Columbia University um, with uh, Mr. Kai Kamrath um, and uh, uh, helped implement Advance there, Community Hospital of Monterey, and then William & Mary, which is my alma mater. Um, and then uh, for a, a little bit of a slice of time, uh, there may have been a time where I was at a vendor or two. I also have spent some time as a fundraiser, which was kind of an interesting adventure. So uh, at one point I decided, you know, systems work. Um, I needed a break, frankly. It happens once in a while, and I thought it would be really interesting to go try to be a major gift officer for a while. And so I uh, went to work for UW Medicine. Uh, they were actually going through their HIPAA compliance at the time, and so they needed, can everyone hear me, by the way? We're good on volume? Okay. Uh, they needed somebody to help them implement HIPAA compliance in the fundraising office. And because I had a systems background, they thought I would be good for that. And I negotiated as I came in and said, okay, I want to use this job to transition into major gifts work. So, you know, started out doing 100% HIPAA compliance, implemented that for about a year, and then gradually transitioned to having a portfolio and supporting a couple of areas within the School of Medicine. Um, did that for a couple of years, and then I went and worked as director of development for Seattle Men's Chorus. Uh, so ran their entire advancement operation, much smaller scale than what I was used to being at large universities. That's a $4 million a year organization. It's actually the largest community chorus in the country. Um, I timed it just right. I arrived there in October of 2008. So that was a fantastic time to take over a fundraising operation <laughs> at a small arts organization. Um, and quite an adventurous couple of years. Um, but I ended up landing at University of Oregon Foundation because that helped me understand that maybe I didn't want to be a fundraiser after all. Uh, so back on the system side now um, and, uh, and having a great time. Uh, it's good to do. Um, I could probably do a whole presentation on what I learned from those experiences, having been a systems person going to fundraising. Uh, the one thing I will say about it that I think is important to say, because there are some times uh, today where I'll knock the fundraisers a little bit, uh, but overall, uh, you cannot imagine, if you haven't done it, how hard that work is. Um, it is tough. Um, I know a lot of times after I finish a conference, I just feel exhausted. Um, 
just about every day as a fundraiser can be like those days because you are putting yourself out there in a way that is exceptionally hard to do. And so uh, anything that I say about how we work with fundraisers, how we work with our partners, is really in light of that context of we need to have a real appreciation for how hard it is for them to do their work on an ongoing basis. So two confessions to start with today. Uh, first of all, um, about three months ago, I did a one-day advancement services uh, down in Tacoma where some regional schools came in and we talked for a day. Um, if anyone in here was at that event, um, there may be some material that uh, has been recycled, and so I might suggest you go to another session. <laughs> so just, just being upfront about that. Uh, the other confession that I have is that uh, Kai Kamrath and I were originally gonna do this as a co-presentation. Um, and uh, I kind of hogged the whole thing. So <laughs> uh, Kai, being the consummate gentleman that he is, has still agreed to be in the room. Uh, and uh, if we have Q&A at the end, uh, we can talk about uh, how some of this relates to Columbia in the same way that I'll be talking about how it relates to the University of Oregon Foundation. But um, he kind of let me expand to fill all the available space. So uh, mostly you're going to be hearing from me this morning. Okay, so why this topic about the technology framework? Um, well, I think we're in an interesting space, and, and I mean that in the best possible way. I really feel incredibly lucky to have landed in this line of work. Um, and, uh, you know, this intersection of technology and business, and I put business in quotes because, you know, for a lot of us who are in nonprofits and at higher educational institutions, you know, handling the data on behalf of a fundraising office, um, you know, we're not technically businesses, but I, I have some stuff to talk about this morning where I think we need to think about what we can learn uh, from looking at those business examples. But business also because there are, of course, business needs. Um, so what are some of the ways we are and are not like businesses? Because I want to talk about some case studies, but I think before we do that, um, we should look at, you know, how are our organizations similar and not similar, just to have some framework to think about. So how are we not like businesses? I actually thought this was the easier one to start with. Um, well, our funding model is usually completely different, uh, which can be both helpful and not helpful. Uh, it's helpful in that we're usually more predictable and fixed. Um, a lot of times we know what my budget is gonna be three years from now, barring some catastrophic change or significant event. Um, a lot of times those are very predictable lines for us. Um, sometimes businesses might be jealous of that, frankly, because those predictable funding models are things that, that they would really love to be able to see, and, and you know, they're much more slaves to the quarter than, than we sometimes have to be. Um, you know, we tend to constantly be trying, though, to wring as much value out of that, that relatively stable line as we can. Um, and so that, a lot of times, is more um, of our calculation. And you know, a lot of times, we're really in a circumstance um, where it's, we're, we're disconnected from the bottom line in a way that uh, means we can lack discipline, frankly. Um, you know, a business, they have to be a slave to it in a way that we never do, but uh, you know, we, a lot of times, you know, they at least have a measure by which uh, their success or their failure is constantly evaluated. A lot of times, you know, our funding is gonna continue whether we're doing an A job or a B minus job or a C minus or unfortunately in some cases a D. Um, that can really continue until you know, something really happens to disrupt our organization. So a little bit different that way. A lot of times discretionary funding is hard to come by in our organizations. Uh, we don't necessarily think that way um, as much. And so um, you know, it, there has to be some big disruption or a product has to be coming to the end of its life cycle before we think about things like, oh, how are we going to replace this? And we may not be in a situation where our organization thinks to build in overhead or maintenance costs or or you know, ongoing funding to really truly support something at the level it needs to be. We just kind of take it out of existing staff time and um, existing dollars. So also, uh, not like a business in that, a lot of times if you have a, a fundraising services shop or an advancement services shop, um, you tend to have one client and they kind of have to use you mostly. Um, now, their choices are increasing and increasing uh, because uh, it's easier and easier for them to go out and start using outside technology and, and that informs some of our discussion uh, today um, and in our business lives. But you know, again, just kind of laying what's generally typically been the framework. How are we like a business? Well, I do think um, it's pretty fair to say that at most universities I've seen or been a part of, advancement tends to be the most entrepreneurial office on campus. Um, and I think as you see, you know, I know at University of Oregon right now, we're seeing 
Uh, development has now expanded to include external relations and government relations. Really, it's been in recognition of the fact that advancement has been in some ways the most innovative office on campus. And so the president of the university is looking to increase their overall responsibility. Um, so let me be clear, when I say entrepreneurial, I don't necessarily think that universities should be just like a business. I'm not advocating that at all. Um, I think the comparison can be useful, but uh, there are things that we are here to do that would never make sense from a strictly profit and loss standpoint uh, or, or strictly from, from taking that model. Um, but we are affected by many of the same trends, I think particularly in technology. Um, we tend to be the area that most has to justify our costs like a business to the extent that that's necessary in a university, even though our funding model is different. But I think most importantly, we can really learn uh, from a lot of their mistakes uh, in case studies, because things are happening a little more quickly in that world, and we're in the position then to stand back and look and observe and see what, what has gone on and what that might mean for us. So I'm gonna pull on a little bit of an older example, Kodak. Um, I'm assuming I'm not the only one in the room who remembers Kodak. <laughs> so I won't ask for raised hands <laughs> because I might have to call on some of you. Um, but Kodak is actually kind of a favorite case study uh, in a lot of business classes uh, for some great reasons. Um, one of those is, you know, today it's really almost non-existent. But, uh, you know, in its day, Kodak was as prevalent as a brand as anything we've got today, uh, as prevalent as a Nike or a Coke or an Apple. Uh, was completely dominant in its market. So in 1976, they had 90% of camera sales and 85% of film sales. Uh, in 1981, $10 billion in revenue, and, and we then have to translate that 30 years forward and think of what that is in today's dollars. Uh, so huge uh, amounts of money. And it's really an interesting thing to ask, why did Kodak go from such dominance to bankruptcy? So what's the conventional wisdom here? Um, you know, I mean, if you're to think about Kodak, why did this amazing business fail? Digital cameras. Digital cameras, right? So the technology landscape changed around them. Yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the common answers. Anyone else? Innovation. Innovation? Yeah. Lack of innovation. OK, sure. Yeah, and, and yeah, maybe in other areas besides just digital camera. But um, other thoughts there? Has anyone yeah. ever had a chance to kind of study this? I'm sorry, vision? vision. Yeah. Right, who did they want to be as a company? What were they trying to achieve? Right, yeah. Uh, and, and then what were they investing, right? Um, so if you ever want to look into this, John Cotter, and I'll mention him again later. Uh, John Cotter is worth knowing about, by the way, because uh, if you look into change, philosophy of change, managing change, he's kind of the recognized authority, and he has an eight-step model for leading change that is absolutely worth looking into. He's applied that. Um, and uh, there's a Forbes magazine article, uh, May 2nd, 2012, where he does, I think, one of the better comprehensive wrap-ups on Kodak that I've seen. But actually, they had all the necessary tools, including they invested significantly in research and development. Um, and it might actually surprise you to know they had the first electronic image sensors, and they were actually the first company to bring a consumer digital camera to market. Uh, they just didn't quite realize what they had, and they weren't really able to transform their business model. Um, but in, they really actually realized this early on. As far, uh, as far back as 1993, they had realized, OK, we're not going to be able to be the same kind of a business. And so they brought in an outside CEO from Motorola who understood digital technology because they saw that this change is coming and we're not keeping up with it. And they had people in the trenches who were putting forward reports and analysis saying, you know, our world as it has been is not going to continue to exist. So why did they really fail? Well, and this is what Cotter gets to in his article. It really kind of ended up coming down to culture. Um, they were overflowing with complacency. Uh, the senior managers could not get past the fact, um, even though the CEO could, there was a layer underneath him that could not get past the fact that this is all going to change. And uh, they kind of had a Gillette model uh, where you know, they had 90% of camera sales because a lot of the cameras were really inexpensive and they were making all of their money on the film. And just like you know, the Gillette razors today, where um, I get sticker shock every time I have to buy a 10-pack at Costco, uh, <laughs> what I'm spending. Um, you know, your first razor is really cheap. <laughs> so, uh, but then they've got you hooked, and you have to keep buying more. Um, they had actually started to fail in their core film business uh, even before the digital revolution. 
uh, Fuji was coming in. Um, and so they were making all of this money on film, and they had never really had a, a competitor who was as inexpensive and as high a quality, but Fuji um, had really started to claim some significant market share um, even before digital cameras came out. Uh, even with the CEO as a champion, you know, somebody comes in from Motorola, is there to transform the business. There was just too much entrenched culture underneath, and the innovators had a barrier to being heard at the top levels. So they had all the ingredients for success, they just could not put them together in the right ways. And their whole business model needed to change, and they just weren't up for doing that because it was this cash cow, and even though the trend line was going downward, it's like, okay, we can't, there was never a point at which it worked for them to sacrifice that in favor of something completely new, and they, they weren't able to make that transformation. So my theory in saying this is not that I think advancement services or technology people in general are complacent, and honestly, I usually see that we're anything but. Um, if I look at the people in my team, if I look at the people I've been lucky enough to work with at a variety of institutions, we want to help, right? We, we want to get in there. We want to know what's going to be effective. It's hardworking, smart people who are trying to help universities raise money. So I don't think that we're complacent. Um, I think these case studies are useful, though, because, you know, that was their barrier to change, complacency. We should be asking what is ours. And a uh, great quote here about the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones. A lot of times that's really our hardest part is looking past how we've always done business and how we have to be set up and why it has to be this way and seeing, okay, what, what is this keeping me from doing or seeing? Um, you know, today I think actually Salesforce is kind of a good example of that. Really non-traditional database design. Um, a lot of us are looking at that and thinking, okay, they're doing innovative stuff. Um, but we're used to having our core database for alumni and donor relations sitting on campus in a box that we can point to. Uh, that's a completely valid issue, uh, and we need to think about that. But there's stuff going on in that platform we should be looking at and learning from and thinking about, okay, what, what could that mean or how could that be applied or how might that be useful, whether we wanted to go with them or not. Not, not making this a, sales, uh, a plug for Salesforce, but. Uh, but there are times where their model is so different, we, we might tend to dismiss it out of hand initially, and, and we don't want to do that. So why is change so hard? Uh, well, <laughs> that's way beyond the scope of what we've got time for today. So um, yeah, you could probably spend uh, yeah, years examining that. Um, so I'm not, not going to get into the, the psychological factors of change or any of those kinds of things. Um, but let's stick with some of the factors that relate to planning for change. So what are some of the technology factors in change? Well, first of all, we all know that it's moving really, really quickly, right? Uh, so there's Moore's Law, you know, computing power doubling every 18 to 24 months. Uh, Metcalfe's Law, which is about uh, how the value of networks increases exponentially with the number of nodes. Uh, so in other words, the more people you have connected to something like a Facebook, um, really any given network, um, the more its value increases. Um, and it really does appear to be an exponential curve. Um, and then also we've got uh, the technology curve. So uh, the S curve of technology, and this is kind of a, a pretty well-known uh, curve that's existed. I don't even know what industry this was first kind of uh, evaluated for, or put forward with, but the idea is, you know, initially you have a phase of, of experimentation and uncertainty, um, and this is the effort that it takes um, versus, you know, the amount of performance you can get from a new technology or innovation. So initially a lot of stuff that doesn't yield much results, but then you get to a point where it just takes off and even a little more effort gets you significantly more returns. Then you get to a point where um, you know, a technology has matured and you really see decreasing returns on it. And so uh, with the Kodak example, this would, be, um, you know, this would be how film was and something that was possible never was before and then you know, it just sticks around for a long time. But then you get to a point where you're just not going to see much new innovation. Um, you know, a, a good color picture is a good color picture, and you know, maybe you innovate a little about a, a better level of detail, or you know, uh, you know, now you can take a picture in half the level of light as you did before, but you know, what you're going to get in terms of new capability by investing additional dollars or time or research effort is, is really only going to go so far. Um, but with any of these sorts of things that, uh, you know, can come up in the past, you know, it's really pretty raw and unreliable at the first, um, and then it gets to a point where it's incredibly useful. Um, but what really starts to happen, and again, you know, we have the, the uh, 
Kodak example where you know you've got the technology curve, but then you've got a new technology that comes along. Um, and it might start out, so you know, you have film cameras and then you have digital cameras that kind of come in here. And initially their capability is far below where the film is. So, you know, the first digital cameras, you know, not even a megapixel of resolution. And, uh, you know, not that useful because printers weren't great enough at that point that when you wanted to take a picture with you. Um, and we didn't really have uh, smartphones at that point. And so um, it wasn't easy to just have something that could display your picture. And so, you know, you still had to print them out. But as that technology matures, it gradually overtakes the old one. Um, and then you've got this performance in your emergent market where you've, you've kind of had this invasion and uh, this new thing is completely better uh, than what came before. I think the other thing though that we see is, you know, digital cameras have themselves been disrupted uh, because, uh, gosh, you know, the, the pictures I can take with my iPhone are now nine megapixels. And, uh, you know, this completely different market came in and has supplanted what came before. Um, and uh, you know, we're starting to see that more and more. I've heard it said a couple of times at this conference and I had never really thought of it in that way before, but it used to be that new technology kind of came from government, um, from defense. Um, it existed there for a long time. It gradually got adapted then maybe into the business world and then eventually it landed with consumers. Really in the last 10 years even, that has completely flipped on its head where a lot of the new technology is really starting with the consumers and then they're coming into the office and they're asking, gosh, I can do this at home so easily. Why is it so hard to do it here on the corporate network? Um, and so the new technology is really starting in the opposite direction and then filtering back up to the business and then to bigger applications rather than the way it used to be. So just pause for a second because thrown a couple of concepts at you um, already. Any, any questions about this, by the way? I should have said at the beginning, I'm always open to interruption or I know there's a crowd of hecklers in here who have you know, <laughs> promised to give me a hard time at some point during the presentation. So, so we don't have bottom line in the same way as business. Uh, we also don't necessarily fail in the same ways. Um, you know, sometimes I've seen that happen, but, but it's pretty rare in our line of work where we just go away completely. But we can pay attention to businesses that have failed for important lessons um, and look at you know, what they have for good strategies to move technology forward and uh, see how we might change in the right ways um, of our own volition rather than by being forced to, um, always advantageous. Um, with technology constantly evolving then, how do we know what the right ways to change are? Well, I'm gonna go to a TED talk. By the way, one of the things um, I love about giving presentations now versus 15 years ago is the ability to aggregate people who are way smarter than I am <laughs> into something that is useful to me and then I hope uh, by sharing it useful to you. Uh, that's fantastic, but I'm sure everyone's heard about TED at this point. If I'd given this talk two years ago, there would have been half the audience saying, who's TED? Um, anyone remember what it stands for, by the way? It's technology entertainment design or technology, is it entertainment? Okay. All right, technology, entertainment, and design. So I saw a great talk on there from Tim Harford, and he was talking about the God complex. And uh, this is another way that our, advancement in, our advancements in thinking and our ways of knowing things have really changed over time. So Tim Harford, he's an economist and a writer, um, and he has studied what makes systems successful. So um, both computer systems, but also personnel systems, companies, organizations. We can think of all of these things as systems. What makes them successful? And what are the common factors um, that you know, the rest of us can learn from? And he tackles the idea of expertise to solve problems. So you know, if we go back in time, um, if we go back in time, you know, say uh, to, I don't know, Thomas Edison, you know, the model then was really one of one really smart person who could solve something and just have this brilliant insight and then the rest of us would learn from that. Well, Tim really tackles this idea by saying, you know, our problems have really gotten too large and complicated for that to, to really work anymore. Um, and that expertise provides uh, both a great background but also oftentimes blind spots. So, so back to that Keynesian idea of, you know, a lot of times the most difficult thing to overcome um, is, is uh, what you're sure you know. So yeah, too big for one brilliant person to solve. Also, we can't always predict uh, what's gonna be coming to disrupt our technology or our shops. Um, so what is the most important common element he said is, uh, he found as he was laying this framework? Any guesses? Anyone? Okay, 
Bueller. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the feedback loop. So the most common element in a successful system is how good is your feedback loop? How much are you listening to the people who are using the technology? Um, how much are you connected to what is going on with them? Uh, this, by the way, is why I think um, some of what's going on in software as a service is really worth looking at um, and paying attention to because unlike past technology platforms, people who are providing software as a service have an ability to really understand how the technology is used in a way that you know, the model of 15 years ago where you know, we have a server on site, we install that software, that company then never knows how it's truly used. That's really a blind spot for them. These folks who are doing software as a service, they can see exactly you know, what features are being used, how well are they understood, what data is being accessed. And those that are smart enough to take advantage of it, their lessons that they're learning, um, that's what's making a lot of it so good. Um, now, that's not necessarily to say we have to go with software as a service. Um, we might just you know, download Salesforce and look at their CRM package and say, hey, I'm going to model mine on that, assuming that's legal. Um, is there anyone from Salesforce in the room? <laughs> I apologize to my new overlords for, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, OK, so anyway, the feedback loop. Um, so he likens it to evolution. And what's interesting here is uh, there are times that this can work, and we don't really even know why. But in our world, we would, we would say that this is iteration a lot of times. Um, and sometimes we do it by accident, right? We uh, come up with our best guess at a solution. We put it out there, and we try it. We see how it works. Uh, we modify and upgrade. We repeat many times. Now, sometimes we do this because we just didn't really think about what we were doing, right? <laughs> um, but a lot of times, it's really good to be intentional about this process and to set that expectation. And I will have these conversations. I mean, especially working with a new partner, I will go in and I will say, look, the first report, we're going to take our best guess. It's going to be about having correct data. Um, but I do not expect that to be our final product. I want you to view that as a prototype. I want you to think of that as your chance to start participating in the process uh, and, and not to look at that as, oh, I didn't get what I wanted, I'm moving on. Um, because really the most important for, uh, part of that is having then the good system for evaluation on each of these loops. And that a lot of times is where I think we fall down, is, is we deliver it, we know it's not quite good enough, um, we intend to improve it over time, but you know, we never really close the loop. We don't go back. Um, or if we do, we, we kind of get our hackles up. Um, the pluses of this approach, well, I think we tend to fall into this anyway. It's just that we tend to view it as maybe a failure. Um, it definitely gets more thinking around the table. Uh, brings people along for the ride. And, and I don't know how many times I've seen it in my career where um, I probably could have gone into the initial meeting and predicted with 95% accuracy what the final answer we were going to arrive at would be. But if I plunked it out down on the table at that first discussion, people would look at it and say, no, that's not it. Yeah, sorry, that's just not going to do it. But if we arrive at it together, it could be exactly the same thing. And then they are invested in it, and they think it's brilliant. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, there's just something about having them involved in the process that way that gets buy-in, as well as their expertise. Um, it also keeps one person from having to know everything. Now, certainly, I love it when uh, the folks on my team learn as much as they can about the business. I think that's integral to our success. But there's just no way for them to know everything. Um, and this has been a, a hard lesson for me in my current shop, uh, because as I shared earlier, I'm used to really being in the fundraising part, um, had gotten to a point where I knew that business inside and out. A lot of times didn't feel like I had to go get that input. Well, now I'm doing systems for accounting and for HR and uh, for investing. Um, and those are areas where I'm starting from scratch, um, which is scary, uh, but also stimulating and interesting um, and uh, a lot of fun given some of the people I get to work with in those areas. Encourages communication, always a good thing when you've got introverted technical people around the table. So um, you know, just putting this model in place from the get-go. And I think intuitively, no, it's a good way to go. I mean, I just see a lot of nodding heads anytime I put this up um, and people get there. Um, but we still don't do it, and we tend to be set up for the God complex. A lot of times, not really even our fault. I think a lot of times our partners come into the room, and, and maybe they expect to just be able to present a problem, and they've worked with someone before and really enjoyed it, and they think the answer is just going to appear rather than um, having it be something we both need to cooperate um, on. Um, and I think there are problems with this approach are real um, and worth acknowledging and, and being clear about. 
Um, it's really hard for people to ask what didn't work. Um, you know, you invest a lot of yourself in any product that you put out, and even though you say this is going to be the first step, you're still proud of it. Um, and you still kind of want to get it right from the get-go. And uh, it's really hard for somebody who invests themselves in the work that they're doing to say, okay, now what's wrong with it? Um, and you have to think about what is your culture like? You know, what are your relationships like with your partners? How are they going to react to that? How do they present uh, constructive criticism? Is it actually constructive? Um, and is it hopefully not even taking the form of criticism so much as uh, additional input? Because um, you have to really be deliberate about how you set up your culture um, so that this is okay and possible. What happens in your organization when there is a mistake or there is a need to go back to something? You know, sometimes people are just going to get it wrong. So it might, be, it might be that something just isn't there yet because that's the natural evolution of whatever we're working on and it, it just takes time to get there. It might also be that somebody just did something plain wrong. They ra added the wrong color, uh, a wrong column of numbers or uh, just reported a fact. So what is your response like um, to your coworkers when they are someone who's made a mistake that has cost you time? Uh, what is my response like as a manager um, if one of my people has to come to me and say that? Um, I hope to make it really positive and, and to say, you know what, that's all right, it happens. You know, how are we going to recover? Uh, but it really bears some thinking about what kind of culture have you set up so that um, this is okay and that this is just um, part of the process. Uh, one other problem with this approach is all feedback created equal. Um, has anyone ever seen that Simpsons episode where uh, Homer discovers a long lost brother who's the president of a car company? Um, and uh, this guy decides that Homer gets to decide to design a new car uh, because you know he's, he basically decides Homer is the epitome of the example of middle America. And so if, if I get something that this guy likes, I will have the most successful vehicle in the history um, of, of, you know, automation, of automotive, uh, in automotive history. So you end up with this vehicle. It's got a Barca lounger in the front seat. <laughs> there's no room for the passenger because there's a fridge for beer. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this thing just ends up being uh, bankrupting the car company that uh, his long lost brother runs. But uh, all feedback is not, unfortunately, created equal. And so that can be a little bit of a delicate balancing act. And, and also one sometimes where managers need to have the back of their staff because um, you know, somebody might be in a meeting and uh, you know, somebody Somebody who's offering the input might be in a position in the organization where they're hard to say no to, but the idea is one that's just not going to fly or work. And so, uh, you know, is the door open for your staff to come in and say to you, I think this is a terrible idea? Um, and, you know, how do we kind of short circuit this? And, you know, are you in a position then to have a good enough relationship to go and make that happen? Uh, do you have senior managers who are willing to admit that they don't know everything? Good luck on this one. So. <laughs> Uh, and then do we have enough time? <laughs> right, never, right? Yeah, so all we need are secure staff plus a positive culture plus plenty of time. <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> uh, which is the hardest to get to? I think it's time, yeah. And I, I, would, I would guess most folks would, you know, because at the end of the day, it's a pretty collegial, we all have our bad days, but we're in a pretty collegial um, line of work. Um, we've got good folks out there. Uh, time uh, tends to be the hardest to get to. And I think the reason for that is, you know, really we're in a world that doesn't always go back to money like businesses do. Uh, there's no disincentive for requests. And so our proxy for money really tends to be staff time. We just assume that that is an endless resource or it feels like that's the assumption. I, I don't assume that about my area and I feel like I'm constantly having to have those conversations about this isn't going to come from nowhere, and everything can't be number one, and at some point we need to decide which five things we're working on instead of which 20. Uh, but uh, there really is no disincentive for, uh, for alumni relations, for advancement to ask for absolutely everything that they need, and then leave it to us to sort out uh, without realizing what throwing that kind of decision over the fence means in terms of our disproportionate power then to determine what's going on in the organization. Not really something I want to do. I want, to, I want whatever we're working on to be the things that are truly most important to the overall fundraising effort, the overall alumni relations effort, but it's really hard to get to what that's going to be. So yeah, time tends to equal money. There might actually be um, a saying about that. 
Um, and incidentally, I don't necessarily even mean this as a criticism. Um, now, sometimes this is a result of you know, lack of internal organization in an office and, and them not being clear on their own priorities. But it's important for us to realize you know, they're in the same circumstance. Um, that, that development officer who's driving me crazy by needing these 15 things, they need those 15 things because their dean wants five of them and their donors want another five of them and their boss wants the third five. Um, so they have no disincentive for all of the requests that they're receiving either. Um, and realizing that sometimes can help kind of cut down on the frustration factor a little. Okay. So can we handle just one more? Um, yeah, so this actually tended to turn into more of a research project than I thought when I took it on. But um, there was a, a session that I went to in Boston, um, and I've mentioned it to a couple of people at this conference, but uh, about four or five months ago. It was actually really amazing. Um, and like this conference, part of what made it effective was, um, uh, you know, I think what's been great about Drive and uh, where uh, the folks at UW do a fantastic job is, unlike a lot of higher education conferences that I tend to go to, they are doing an exceptional job of tapping into the greater technology community in Seattle and really nationwide. And so I'm getting some thinking that goes beyond sort of the, the typical fundraising folks that I hear from, and that's fantastic and challenging. Uh, so I went to a five-day intensive in Boston uh, that was put on by Boston University and uh, CIO Magazine. CIO Magazine is Chief Information Officer Magazine, and it was actually perfect for where I was, because the idea is it was for people who are the chief technology person in their organization um, and uh, who were on the senior team and needing to bridge that gap between the other senior managers and themselves. Um, and uh, what was fantastic about that is um, the other thing that's unusual for me about my current job is I am the only person who has been in higher education for my almost all of my career. Uh, the president of the foundation is a financial guy. Uh, the chief compliance officer who heads up the accounting unit um, comes from that accounting and finance background. And then we have a chief investment officer, comes off of Wall Street. Um, oftentimes on that team, I'm the only one who's bringing in that traditional higher education perspective. So I couldn't fall back on, well, this is how universities work, the way I've been able to in the past. In addition to that, I'm the only technology person there. So there are two ways in which I'm in a completely different world um, than they're used to operating in. And so, uh, this five-day intensive that I did was fantastic because it was specifically for bridging that gap between technology and senior managers. Um, it was uh, pricey, but uh, I highly recommend it for anybody who's in the role because I learned more there than I think I have in any other professional development opportunity I've had. Um, also, I lucked out and I had uh, a hotel room on Fenway Park during the World Series. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I probably could have made a profit on the conference if I had just been willing to sell out my room for a night because <laughs> I was sitting in there with a glass of wine watching the game. It was fantastic. Uh, but uh, Professor Venkatraman, who uh, he is on the faculty at Boston University, he's worth looking up. He had a great model that tied a lot of this together for me. And what he's done is he's, uh, he's kind of graphed uh, innovation versus implementation along one axis, and then IT and IS managers versus business managers along another. Um, and so down here in the bottom quadrant where you're really looking at um, the implementation area of things, we've decided what to do and we're just either doing it or uh, we're perfecting it. These are the areas where we're supporting today's strategy. And these tend to be our cost centers and our profit centers. And then if we move up to where we're wanting to really invest in innovation, this is where we're shaping our future strategy, and these are our investment centers and our growth centers. So this is where the business is going to grow over time, right? Um, and his contention was, you know, it's so easy to spend all of our time down here really on both sides, because this is where we're comfortable. This is where Kodak was, right? Um, but, you know, the businesses that last are the ones that invest in and then also listen to what's going on here. And so um, IT as really a center that oftentimes is mostly about implementation, but oftentimes is really the business's primary means for innovation. You know, we need to be balancing all of these. Um, so this is kind of the today versus tomorrow. Um, how much are we going between our cost centers and then our investment centers? And uh, again, he saw IT as really central to all of this. And this was challenging to me because, you know, we just don't think this way in higher ed. 
We don't, we don't label our business units according to whether they're a cost center or a profit center or an investment center. Um, we're not necessarily thinking about implementation versus innovation on an axis. Uh, I do think we think a lot about IT and IS managers versus business managers. Uh, but a lot of times our business managers are really as much practitioners. There's somebody who's fundraising half the time and then running their unit the other half of the time. Um, and so, you know, the question is how much time are you spending where? Um, and are you really then at the center where you should be? Uh, this is not to say you need to be controlling everything, by the way. I think that would be completely inappropriate. Again, you want your role to be one where you're balancing these things and you're being responsive to the business and maybe sometimes even getting there before they do. Um, and, and suggesting the solutions before they have to ask for them. But you know, really think about, are you putting yourself squarely in the middle here? And I realize that IT and advancement services were often 90% in the bottom left. So we're 90% here on implementation and on doing it in technical areas. Um, fundraising would really never accept this in their world, or if they are, they're not really setting themselves up for long-term success. Um, it would be like never having a pipeline for new donors, right? Um, we'd be spending all our time asking the same folks for the same stuff over and over again, and at some point, that will just uh, lead to failure. But our most frequent requests, and often our most demanding customers, are the people who are in the profit centers, not the growth centers. Um, now, that's not to say that it's not a legitimate request, um, you know, but you know, I would think of annual giving as more of a profit center. Um, it's one that is sort of building that pipeline for the future, but you know, they're calculating what they're going to do this year in terms of a few percentage points of increase year to year. And, and, but a lot of times they're our biggest customer. Uh, same way with alumni associations. Um, you know, they're, they're thinking about, okay, how do I meet my budget to keep my doors open and to keep the shop up and running and keep all of my staff employed, not necessarily about, hey, how am I gonna transform the way this university relates to its alumni um, or its donors? So this codified something that's been working well for me at University of Oregon Foundation, um, which uh, I wouldn't necessarily have predicted would be an advantage coming in, but there are times where the power of being a separate organization is incredibly helpful. Um, so, uh, because I have more power to say no in this job than I ever have before. Um, now, I try not to exercise that carelessly and I try to be really smart about it, but because technology is sometimes thrust into the role of referee, because it's our resources that are determining what can be done, um, it's really great to be able to do that um, while actually being able to say no. Because I think a lot of times we're de facto in that role, but then we're not able to really put thumbs up or thumbs down on anything. Actually, I have a deal with the Vice President for Development now um, where I, I got so tired of going into meetings and having somebody kind of ambush me by saying, Mike Andreessen said this is the new number one priority that uh, two weeks ago I emailed him and I said, the next time somebody tells me you have a new top priority and I haven't heard it from you first, whatever it is is on hold for six months, okay? <laughs> so, because if it's not important enough for you to have picked up the phone and told me yourself, uh, then that poor person is just gonna have to suffer for a while. Um, so, uh, strategy, um, Strategy isn't just the senior manager's job, by the way. I'm not as smart as Steve Jobs, and I know it. I'm also not as smart as a lot of the folks on my team, uh, and I know that too. Um, I have you know, maybe some different skill areas, and, and at some point somebody has to manage the area. Um, but a lot of times, um, I'm very aware of the fact that uh, people on my team have something to contribute that I could never offer. Um, and so uh, we work hard to get away from the God complex and having one person have to know everything um, and have it be much more about a successful feedback loop and our ability to work together uh, and have a positive culture. Um, by the way, one thing we do at the foundation that I love to let people know about, we have a final interview for anyone who's hired um, that uh, is with the, the senior management team. So uh, we have a position open. People get interviewed. The hiring department will determine whether somebody is technically qualified to do that job. Uh, the final interview with the senior team, so the, this poor person is walking in the door and they have to deal with uh, three vice presidents and the president of the foundation. It is all about culture. Um, it is all about how well do you communicate. It is all about how do you handle conflict. It is all about what are your values, what is your motivation to want to do this kind of work. Um, and I would say two thirds of the time somebody will make it through and about a third of the candidates do not. Uh, because the importance of a positive culture and that ability to collaborate, lack of silos, 
um, people working towards a positive goal rather than assigning blame or being unable to handle conflict. The amount of time that we don't waste because we don't spend our energy there, uh, because we make sure that people are really good at that stuff in addition to being able to do the core job, uh, has led to incalculable savings. So that's a practice that I love to let people know about because it's been tremendously effective for our organization and I recommend maybe not exactly the same way of doing it, but something absolutely to pay attention to in your hiring processes. Okay, so again, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. I feel like I'm talking maybe a little faster than normal, um, but uh, just to summarize again, so we're wanting to set the stage for a strategically focused uh, shop why well, throw all of this stuff your way? Well, this is some great thinking, by which I don't really mean my own. Um, I, I love to give you some things that you can go and look at on your own um, if something is of interest to you. And so I want to just point you to um, uh, a couple of those kinds of resources. And I think the folks I've mentioned are well worth looking up. Um, these are also things that are fantastic for you to be able to share up the chain in your shop. Um, and it really backs up, you know, if you agree that these are good ways to go, this gives you some ammunition to say, hey, by the way, this is the article. And I, I do this a couple of times a week where the rest of the senior team, hey, I just read this and this is a really interesting way to think about, you know, implementing something or there's this great article on such and such and constantly trying to bridge that gap and educate them um, and be on the same page with how we think about things. And they're doing the same for me. So that's just a part of how we operate with each other. You know, they're just doing about investments or, the fascinating world of accounting. Um, so, so what's our emerging checklist for some of the things we want to have in place to consider technology? So um, learn from the businesses that are working or not all around us and why that's happening. Uh, look for your own barriers to change. Uh, be aware of the forces and disruptors driving change in the technology world. Have a good feedback loop to manage internal change positively, and, and that includes a culture that absolutely supports this. And then realize you need to allocate time for your innovation efforts. So this sets the stage and helps determine what the strategies might be. Um, at some point, senior managers have to decide on what they will be. Uh, and that process is one that can be radically different from place to place. Um, so some quick ways to steer that conversation that have helped me to the extent that that might help you. Um, and by the way, I should say, you know, I, I don't mean to be up here presenting this as a fait accompli, something that I have mastered and, and I'm now passing on to you. These are things that I have found helpful. I would say after a year and a half as part of the senior team, I'm just now getting to the point where I've built the trust um, and the understanding uh, of my area in such a way that we're having these conversations on the level that I, I find most helpful and effective. So just being completely transparent about that. Uh, one of the presentations I was in yesterday actually really solidified this for me because uh, I think it was the Click presentation. And he said, you know, at the end of the day, people don't trust data. People trust other people. And so I can put all the graphs in front of other managers that I want to. Um, I can quote all the articles that I want to. I can tell them what research indicates. But it's really building that relationship and having them trust me over time, delivering some successful projects, giving them things that actually make their world more useful or make technology more useful in their world um, that, that gets us there. So the best thing that I've learned is to switch the focus away from what I need and how I need to increase resources to do what they're asking for and talk much more about the problems that I'm trying to solve. Um, and uh, really in terms of the business objectives. So more stable operating environment, freeing up staff time, increasing data accuracy, better information delivery. Because uh, really it was so easy for me to go to this first. Can't get to that until we have a budget or more staff. Doesn't work. Discussing the task list forces you to say no and not yet, and we mean more stuff. Whereas discussing um, resources leads to a lot of, well, what are all of the people you're currently doing? And also a lot of technical speak that bores the crap out of them. Um, discussing what we're trying to accomplish speaks in that common management language uh, and helps us understand really what we're trying to achieve and it's a much better conversation to be having because buying SQL Server at the end of the day is not an accomplishment. Delivering a better information across our systems is. Um, all right, I think I'm at time. <laughs> So, uh, sorry, not a lot of time for questions, um, but um, there's one or two more slides where I'd suggest you maybe look for it online. Um, this is something I look to have throughout the organization and not just me, with me, so it's why I like to put this in front of practitioners. Um, 
And uh, as always, it's a great privilege to have you take an hour of your time um, and trust me with, with uh, providing something of value in that. So I really appreciate you being here today. And um, thanks very much. Have a good rest of the day. Thumbs up. <laughs> thanks. Hi, everyone. I just have a quick announcement for you. Uh, the breakout session right now, there's uh, Top Pot donuts being provided for you by iModules. So go out there and grab a donut and some coffee and enjoy.